You see the difference. I, I like the feedback. See, don't, don't, don't like that. It kind of adds a little. Thunderous preaching up there. All right, why don't you, if you got a Bible, and, um, and if you don't, we have counselors standing by. Uh, we're, we're in 2 Thessalonians, app on your phone account, but we're in chapter 2. So uh, Bill kind of helped uh, uh, give us the background on, on this epistle. Uh, and there uh, is confusion in, uh, in the church there in Thessalonica. Uh, some false teachers have come in, and Paul is seeking to, uh, to address it. Uh, and it has a lot to do with the rapture of the church. And so Paul lays out in chapter 2 uh, basically the theology of what we call the pre or before the tribulation rapture. Uh, this is certainly is the position of, uh, of Calvary Chapel. Uh, and the reason that we hold this position, it's the position of the Apostle Paul. So I think we're in pretty good company there. And I'll, I'll try to make a case for that uh, as we go through chapter 2. I wanted to read a little quote from uh, a book entitled Immeasurable by Sky Jathani. Uh, and he says the following about a, a, a previous world leader, because we're talking about a future world leader. Uh, and it's kind of astounding to think that one guy could derive so much power uh, over people, uh, but see if you can figure out who this is. This leader lifted up an entire nation in a time of despair. He mobilized his people against unimaginable odds with a clear vision and inspiring passion. He launched a movement that has impacted literally everyone alive today. He set in motion an industrial and scientific revolution that produced the first computer, the first jet airplane began human exploration of space and unlocked the mystery of nuclear energy. Almost every aspect of the modern world has, in one way or another, been influenced by this man. By the time he died, at uh, the age of only 56, everyone on the planet knew his name, and without a doubt, this leader changed the world. Who's the leader? Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler. Yeah, we kind of, you know, we read this stuff about the Antichrist, and it's like it's hard for us to wrap our mind around it. But uh, uh, we've seen this kind of power and passion uh, before in uh, evil leaders here on the planet. But uh, they are all, of course, pale uh, in reflection or in comparison to this person referred to uh, as the Antichrist. So I'm going to go through uh, the first 12 verses here of chapter 2. There will be five, I think, clear statements uh, about the Antichrist uh, being revealed, and we'll see how that uh, plays into this idea of a pre-tribulation rapture. Uh, verse 1. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gather gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means. For that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion, that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned, who do not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Well, let's pray here for a moment. Lord, we just kind of commit this time to you. Thank you for a wonderful time of worship, just drawing close to you, getting our eyes on you, uh, and that's what we want to do. We're going to learn about this man, but of course our eyes are looking to Jesus Christ, not the Antichrist. 
but it tells us and speaks to us at the times that we're living in, Lord, and that we might be immovable, our word here for this conference, onipa'a, nothing would shake us, and we would hold to the truth of your word. May you use that word to uh, encourage us to be immovable now, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So five statements. The first one is the Antichrist will be revealed prior prior to the day of the Lord, and I'll give you three reasons why. One is the rapture of the church is prior to the event of the day of Christ, uh, and we see that in verse 1. Now, brother, concerning, very key word, coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and gathering together to him, that's the rapture, we ask you not to soon be shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come first. So uh, the word coming here is uh, parousia, and it refers to uh, uh, an arrival. Uh, it's a, in a positive sense, uh, not a negative sense. And we're gathered with him. And that's the distinction between Christ coming for the church uh, in the rapture, coming with the church uh, at the end of the tribulation period, the day of the Lord, uh, the, the time of Jacob's trouble, known by several uh, names, described uh, explicitly in the book of Revelation as that seven-year period. Here's a couple of reasons that speak of this uh, distinction between th these two events. The Lord comes for the church at the rapture. At the second coming, he comes with the church. At the rapture, resurrection is prominent at his second coming, it's not mentioned. At the rapture, the Lord comes to reward believers. At the second coming, he comes to judge the earth. At the rapture, believers are taken from earth. At the second coming, believers are with him coming to earth. At the rapture, there's no mention of establishing a kingdom. At the second coming, Christ will set up his kingdom. So two very distinct uh, things that, uh, that we're looking at here. And Paul says, don't think that you're living in the day of Christ or the day of the Lord or the great tribulation. You may have some tribulations, uh, but you're, you're not living in the great tribulation as some of the false teachers were telling the people in Paul's day there in Thessalonica. So he's writing this to correct that thinking. Uh, the second reason we know this is true, the Antichrist will be revealed prior to the day of Christ because we know he'll sign a seven-year agreement with Israel uh, allowing them to uh, rebuild uh, the temple. Therefore, if believers are around, it's not going to be no mystery who this guy is. I mean, this guy rises up out of the European Union. We'll give you a few more details about him in a moment. Uh, but he, any guy that signs a seven-year deal, a seven-year covenant with the nation of Israel that allows them to rebuild the temple, that guy is, uh, is the Antichrist. And by the way, this is on the table. The European Union a few years ago established the protocol for signing seven-year covenant agreements with nations, and Israel in particular. And, uh, and so uh, this is already on, under discussion by world, world leaders. Uh, and uh, thirdly, we know that the Antichrist will be revealed prior to the day of Christ because he'll be revealed to Israel midway through the tribulation. In the middle of the tribulation, in that uh, temple, he will walk in, as we've just read, uh, and uh, declare himself to be God and be, na be, be demanded to be worshipped. Uh, more about that in verse 4. So the first thing we're seeing is the Antichrist will be revealed prior to the day of the Lord. Secondly, the Antichrist will be revealed as a pretense of God himself. His pretense, of course, is seen in his title. Now, Paul does not use the word Antichrist. It's John the Apostle that actually uses uh, uh, that term. Anti is a prefix that has two meanings. It means against, and he certainly will be, but it means instead of. He will be the Messiah that people will accept instead of the true Messiah, uh, G Jesus Christ. And um, here Paul uses two titles for him. Uh, one is the man of sin. One is the son of perdition. Uh, the man of sin describes him as the embodiment uh, of, uh, of evil, uh, completely immoral. Uh, Jesus referred to him as the abomination that causes desolation. Uh, and uh, that refers to a Jew. That means idolatry and immorality. And this man will be the embodiment of, uh, of both of those things. Thirdly, uh, the son of perdition is another name. That speaks of his destiny, what's going to happen to him uh, in the end. Uh, and John says this about 
that term uh, in John 17, 12. While I was with them in the world, this is Jesus speaking, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me I have kept, and none of them is lost except, and there's the term, son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Uh, who's the son of perdition in that context? It's Judas. Where's Judas? He's in hell. Uh, and so that's, that's the idea of the destination. The Antichrist eventually, as a son of perdition, that's his destination. That's where he will go. Now, in the book of Revelation, John refers to him as well as the beast. It's a little confusing when you just kind of read through because you, you have at times Satan referred to as a beast, the false prophet referred to as a beast, and the Antichrist referred to as a beast. But it's uh, if a little study and you can distinguish them. Uh, our guy is mentioned uh, here in Revelation 13, again with the name the, the beast, Revelation 13, uh, 1 to 4. Then I stood at the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rising out of the sea, out of the nations. Having said he seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. Uh, this is, again, reference back to Daniel 9, the descriptions of nations and so forth. His feet are like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. That's Satan. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marvel, marveled and followed the beast. So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, who is able to make war against him? There's one little, not to get too far into the weeds, but there's a, a little manuscript thing that uh, kind of needs to be cleared up. Uh, when the, it says, Then I stood, that's, that's not John, uh, that's actually Satan. It's um, Hestimi, and it's in a third person singular, uh, we, and so it's not first person. So it, it's really, I should say, uh, And the dragon stood on the shore of the sea, uh, and he saw a beast rising out of the sea. So the Antichrist uh, is, uh, is empowered by Satan. Uh, it's not John watching this happen. Uh, it's Satan happen, hap, uh, causing it to happen. You have the heads representing seven world empires. Uh, the horns represent ten kings uh, who rule for a period of time. And the Antichrist eventually takes over, becomes that one world uh, leader, therefore the Antichrist receives that title. Secondly, his pretense is seen in an apparent resurrection. Um, verse 3, And I saw one of his heads, as if it had been mortally wounded, he was deadly wounded, uh, was healed, and all the world mar marveled and followed the beast. So the Antichrist, this man, and uh, a lot of people think he's, he's alive and well, and he's out there somewhere on planet Earth, he's a world leader, and he's making his way up the chain of command. Uh, He's going to, at some point in time, as he arises to the top, he's going to receive a, a mortal wound. It will appear that he's died. Uh, there's some, some people that believe it'll be like an, an assassination attempt, something very dramatic. And he appears to die, and then he resurrects. Uh, and at that point, infused with the power of Satan, uh, people are marveling at him because of this resurrection and so forth. Zechariah gives us this other little detail that's, that's kind of interesting and just to help make the case that if we, if we were here, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to figure out who this guy is. Zechariah is uh, using a terminology to talk about shepherds, good shepherds uh, and um, foolish shepherds, uh, and he uses that terminology to describe uh, the Antichrist. This is in Zechariah 11:17, 17, uh, and this fits with uh, this idea of the attempted assassination of his life. Verse 17, Woe to the worthless shepherd, that's the Antichrist, who leaves the flock, he's not faithful, a sword shall be against his arm and against his right eye. His arm shall, be, shall completely wither and his right eye shall be totally, totally blind. Now we're thankful that Russell made a recovery with his right eye, so we're not, we're not thinking he's the Antichrist, right? <laughs> Recovered from that, right? But do you understand if the church is around at this point and you got some world leader, he appears to be killed and then he resurrects. But part of the outcome, he loses his right eye and he loses his right arm. 
Let's see, right arm, right arm. I think that's the guy right there. You, you can see that the church can't be here with what we know uh, and, uh, and have this guy come on the scene. Secondly, the Antichrist will be revealed, again, as a pretense of God himself. It's seen in the titles. It's seen in apparent resurrection. And thirdly, uh, his pretense will be revealed when he sets himself up against God. Verse 4, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Therefore, the Jewish temple has got to get rebuilt. If he's going to show up in the temple halfway through, uh, part of the deal, part of the covenant with Israel will allow them to rebuild the temple. This idea has been on the table so long, it was known for a period of time as the Clintonian plan, as in President Clinton. It was one of his team's proposal. How do we satisfy both the Jews and both the Palestinians? How do we get the Jews in Israel to go along with giving the Palestinians East Jerusalem as their capital? And one suggestion was we, we get them to allow the Jews to rebuild the temple up there on the Temple Mount. That might do it. They, they might go along with that. This idea is not just in the Bible. Uh, it's in the political spectrum of uh, world leaders and has been under discussion for some time. Just a couple of slides, and I won't be able to see you, but the first one of, uh, is, again, just you, you see the Dome of the Rock. You're kind of familiar with that. <coughs> and, uh, and you'll see that there's a, there's a place to the, uh, to the north side uh, that's very open, uh, and there's uh, space there for, uh, for rebuilding that. And then you can go on to the, the next slide. Uh, so, again, it, it would be uh, uh, up to the top of the slide. You see that very large area. Uh, you go on to the next slide, uh, and uh, there's the dome. It would be to the right. There's one more, and I think that shows the blueprint. All right, that's a model of what the temple will look like. Now, that's what I want you to see. You can see the Dome of the Rock. This is to scale, only to show you there's room up there uh, to build it. I have to tell you a story now. <laughs> so Pastor Bill is over in, uh, in uh, Israel doing a tour with my other good friend from Calvary Chapel, Okinawa, Rick Barnett. And uh, they're up. <laughs> at the uh, at the top uh, on the Dome of the Rock, and then to that side, the area we're discussing, there's small a small dome called the Dome of the Spirits, and uh, uh, Bud's doing a, a, a teaching there, uh, and you know they've got their their two churches and they're kind of gathered around, but you know uh, Bud doesn't mind raising his voice a little on the Temple Mount talking about the Bible, so a few there's other Christians around, they kind of well, I've never heard this before prophecy, and they're gathering around, and and all of a sudden the uh, the uh, um, uh, the uh, Muslim guys that are guarding the area are getting a little concerned. You're, and so they're, they're kind of, oh, we got a, a crowd going on. What's going on over here? And that's when uh, Pastor Rick said, that's when I learned that um, Bud was actually a, a, a Jedi because, <laughs> because those guys gathered around and, and started to stare him down. He looked at him and said, there's no problem here. <laughs> there, tr true story. There's nothing to see here. And they all left him. You can shake his hand later. Yeah, it's amazing. But there, there's room for it to be to be rebuilt there. And in Revelation 11, it even mentions um, the idea of the possibility because not the entire temple, but just the temple proper needs to be rebuilt. 11, Revelation 11, 1. Then I was given a, a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But leave out the, cor the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles, which uh, in this case would be the, uh, the, the Muslims. Uh, and again, one of the uh, other uh, very interesting things that's just um, kind of become popular uh, very recently in you know, the last couple of three months, although it's uh, based on the uh, of a work uh, uh, from 1994, uh, and that is the idea that what we call the Temple Mount was actually uh, the area where the Roman garrison was. It, ma it matches the, the exact de de uh, dimensions. Josephus makes several references to it uh, in his writings, uh, and therefore uh, there's a lot of folks that think in the current excavation that's going on in the city of David, they may in fact 
find or may have already found some evidence that the temple was there. If that becomes true, and it would have to be very concrete evidence to, to convince uh, uh, Orthodox Jews in Israel uh, for that to be true, uh, then that would be a game changer because now, now they could rebuild. And uh, it, it makes that deal easier. But either way, the Antichrist is going to make a way for them to rebuild the temple. It gets rebuilt because in the middle, three and a half years, he walks inside of it, puts, puts up an image of himself and demands to, uh, to be worshipped. Either way, uh, it, gets, uh, it gets rebuilt. Again, you're, you're not sure that uh, uh, people in this world are ready to worship a person. Uh, it wasn't that long ago that the entire country of Japan worshipped the emperor as as God. I mean, and it, you can see the culture around us how this would this would not be a hard thing to to pull off. Uh, and even the Jews, if you talk to the the people that are part of the Temple Mount, uh, they already they already have uh, everything they need in the temple. They have people trained for it. They have all everything they they need to rebuild it. I, mean, I think this thing would go up in weeks, not not months, uh, once they got the. Uh, the green light. Uh, and when you're in Jerusalem and you visit them, which is a fascinating thing to do and see the garments the high priest will wear and so forth, uh, it's kind of scary because they start talking about the reason they're doing this is because they believe God is going to send a man like the prophet Moses. I mean, not the Messiah in terms of someone that claims to be the son of God like Jesus, but somebody who is just a man, a great political leader. He'll be a man of peace. He's going to allow us to rebuild the temple. And with that temple in place, world peace will break out. Once we have, it's like, oh my gosh, they're, they're describing the Antichrist. They haven't read these scriptures. They don't know what we know, but it's, uh, you, you get chicken skin, but you come out of there a little, a little, it's kind of fascinating. You come out a little depressed. It's like, oh my gosh, they are, they are so ready uh, for all of this happen and this deception. Antichrist is going to be revealed prior to the day of the Lord in the pretense of God himself. <clears throat> Thirdly, he'll be revealed at the proper time. That's in verse 6 and 7. And now you know what is resta- restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. <clears throat> For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he, so that's the question, who is the he who now restrains will do so until he, who is that he, is taken out of the way. So first we'd say the proper time will come after he, who is the one restraining him, is removed, as we saw there uh, in verse verse 7. Now Paul had told the Thessalonians this when he was with them before, because he makes, makes uh, reference to it. Uh, there's a restrainer, the he, that is already at work in this world at the time of Paul, our time today, and that he must be taken out uh, it must be removed. Again, so uh, who is the restrainer? Who has the power to restrain the power of Satan and the work of Satan uh, in, in this world? Well, I think Matthew, uh, Matthew 16, 18 helps clarify some of that. You're probably familiar with this verse taking place there in Caesarea Philippi in northern Israel and, uh, in verse 18. And I also say to you, Peter, uh, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Uh, what, what prevents the, the power of Satan? And um, what, what I believe it is, it is the Holy Spirit in the life of the church. I also think it's very wrong to say it's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's going to be removed, uh, and, that's, uh, and then once that, that happens, uh, then you will have uh, the Antichrist no longer restrained and reveal himself. That's a very bad theological statement because the Holy Spirit is God, and if he's God, then he's omnipresent. He cannot be removed. If he could be removed, then he's not God, and we no longer have the Trinity. So it's wrong to say the Holy Spirit's going to be removed. He's not. He's going to be at work during the tribulation period. There will be tens and tens of thousands of Jews and Gentiles being saved during that period of time. But the church, the church with the Holy Spirit in us, church age believers are removed uh, at this this time. For example, uh, in the Old Testament, Lot was um, uh, not a dedicated man, but his presence in the town of Sodom and Gomorrah prevented God's uh, judgment from uh, from coming. And uh, you know, there's a 
there's a lot of uh, people out there, uh, academic types, political types, and so forth, that uh, uh, express uh, disdain for Christians and don't like us. Uh, but it's like, man, are they going to miss us? You know, I, I remember seeing a, a billboard uh, in Texas a couple years into the Obama administration. He had, it was a huge billboard of or George W. Bush, and there had just a little caption that said, Miss me yet? And uh, sorry. <laughs> There can be a lot of people missing Christians. There's a lot, going to be a lot of people that miss the presence of the church because literally all hell's going to break out uh, after the rapture. Again, this man is revealed prior to the day of the Lord as a pretense to God, and it's going to be at the proper time once the church is removed from planet Earth. Fourthly, the Antichrist will be revealed in the power of Satan. And that's in verses uh, 8 and 9. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the work, working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. So the power of Satan will include, again, these counterfeit miracle signs and wonders. Paul calls them lying wonders, and it's not because they're not real miracles. They are real miracles, and they cause people to believe a lie. That's what makes them lying, lying wonders or lying uh, miracles. Uh, the Antichrist seems to be a, a normal world leader, trying to make the world a better place and so forth, uh, trying to get everybody on a hillside and light a candle and drink a Coca-Cola so we can have world peace. Uh, that was a commercial for a very long time. Uh, it, but he's going to use these miracles to deceive uh, the world. And, of course, uh, our, um, uh, we're set up for it uh, in the world, uh, uh, certainly uh, in Europe. And when the rapture happens in Europe, <laughs> they won't notice. They won't notice, right? There's not, that, that, not, there's not too many believers there. They actually won't notice. Uh, it, it'll be kind of devastating to our, uh, our, our country. Uh, but uh, there'll be a lot of people that are deluded and believe this guy because we've removed the idea out of our government schools. They used to be public, now they're government. Out of the government schools, uh, we don't teach kids critical thinking. We, don't, we actually don't teach them to think at all. I, I read a statistic that was uh, really alarming. Uh, they did uh, testing with, uh, with kids going to Harvard, right? Our best and our brightest. Pretty tough school to get into, right? Uh, they tested them again four years later. Dumber, sorry, they're dumber. I mean, just uh, in th critical thinking, uh, uh, just uh, 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 basic questions about society, about history, about what, world events, what's going on. Uh, they all scored much worse. Uh, uh, that, that's a, one of our best schools. They're not making kids brighter. They're actually dumbing them down. And, uh, and you can talk to anybody that works in the, the public schools or Pastor Kev that deals with a lot of, a lot of those kids as a social worker. Uh, and... Um, uh, there's a reason that private school, Christian schools, and homeschooling is, uh, is uh, growing at uh, such a huge rate. I think our society is being prepped to be deluded by the Antichrist. Fifthly, the Antichrist will be revealed, uh, and many will perish. Again, second half of verse 10, they perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they believe, will believe the lie, and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. So those that perish has, will be deceived. And that's, that's Satan, right? And he's the great, uh, great deceiver. Uh, we're warned in the Bible that there are false Christians who are really children of the devil, Matthew 13, 2 Corinthians 11. He has false ministers who preach a false gospel, 2 Corinthians 11. Uh, Galatians 1. There's even a synagogue of Satan mentioned in Revelation 2, which means a gathering of people who think they're worshiping God and they're really not. There's uh, false Christians that have a counterfeit righteousness, and, uh, and of course, uh, they will come to the Lord one day, uh, and, uh, and he'll say, I never knew you, uh, a, a false assurance of faith. Uh, secondly, they perish because, notice, they refuse to love the truth because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Uh, uh, Winston Churchill, of course, is, is quoted quite a bit and uh, appropriate, 
appropriately so. Uh, he, he said the following once, Men occasionally stumble over the truth, but most of them pick themselves up and hurry off as if nothing had happened. <laughs> Uh, and, and certainly truth is hard to come by in terms of world events and everything that's on the media and fake news and, uh, and so forth. Uh, but there are people out there who will refuse to love the truth in terms of the gospel and who Jesus is, what it is to be saved by his, his grace. The vast majority of the people on this planet will be lost. Many of them will die in the terrible judgments that will come uh, that we see depicted in the book of Revelation. And that's going to happen until Christ returns and then separates the, uh, the, uh, the lost from, from the saved. Uh, thirdly, those that perish will receive a powerful delusion actually from God. Verse 11, for this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie. And uh, we kind of have a picture of this, of course, with Moses and Pharaoh. Uh, Moses making his appeal several occasions, uh, the miracles that come and so forth, uh, Pharaoh giving lip service to God, uh, seeming to uh, allow the children of Israel to leave Egypt, uh, and then uh, contradicting that, and then uh, another uh, ensuing plague and so forth. And Pharaoh, it says, Pharaoh hardened his heart, and then it says in the end, God hardened his heart, so that that plan of redemption for God's people, the Jewish people at that time, would, uh, would uh, play out and they would uh, be set free. So who, who perishes? It's those who do not believe the truth and they delighted uh, in, in wickedness. And again, so that Paul uh, would not be uh, discouraged uh, and these believers, no matter what uh, came up in their life, uh, he was making sure they did not believe in a post-tribulation rapture. Uh, there, there are difficult times they're living in, and there's more diffi difficult times, more persecution that's coming. And we could say that is true for us. There's nothing in here that promises in the end there's going to be a great revival. Actually, what's promised is there'll be a great falling away. Now, we pray for a revival. We pray that God one more time would, uh, would pour out His Spirit here in the islands, as he's done in the past, and certainly across our country uh, in other places uh, around the world. Uh, but that's not what promised. Uh, God wants us, though, as believers to not be discouraged because we'll be removed in the rapture before all of this takes place. Uh, and this is the verse of the rapture that Bill uh, quoted for us last night. First Thessalonians 4, uh, I'll read verse 16 to 18. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together. And that's where we get our word rapture, the caught up, caught up together with them in the clouds uh, to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. I just want to, in closing, uh, if, if you haven't ever seen this or, or realized that this idea, uh, very key in there, we're, we're so caught up in the word, the word rapture and when it's going to happen, sometimes we miss the encouraging part. <clears throat> and one of aspects of that is the together with them. That means when we're, <clears throat> when we're caught up at the rapture, we're going to be with other believers instantaneously in the same time, in the same space. It means I won't have to go looking for my mom. She's, she's going to be right there. That's exactly what that means. I won't have to go looking for uh, Kathy, Kathy's parents, who I was very close to. And the time you marry a local family and they take you in and treat you like a son, you, you become close. And uh, they'll, when I'm raptured, I'll be, they'll be right there. That's what that means. You will be with those believers at the same exact time and exact space and Paul says, you should be encouraged by that. And, that, and that's coming. And, uh, and that's the idea of that passage. And that's why Paul is writing this letter and includes these remarks about the Antichrist. Not that we're going to have our eyes on looking for, because we're out of here, but it, it makes the case for the idea of being raptured prior to all of these events uh, taking place. We should expect to see the Lord we should live in what we call the doctrine of imminent return, 
knowing that Christ could come for us uh, at, uh, at any time. And it's something that should encourage us uh, each uh, and every day as we get up and we think about uh, another day. Lord, you've given me another day to serve you. What can I do uh, for, for you? There's, uh, we're getting ready to do um, an uh, uh, Alan Redpath book with the guys, and we've done a few. And there's uh, his commentary on 1 Corinthians is the royal route to heaven. I, I, we did that study, and I'm really familiar with the book. I, I never, I don't think I ever read the poem that the title comes from, and I, I can't give you all, all five stanzas, but I'll just give you the first one. He says, there's a royal route to heaven. Will you travel it today? Tis the life of full surrender all along the homeward way. It is yielding every moment to our blessed Savior's will, seeking only for his glory and his purpose to fulfill. That's what we want to be about. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for uh, your word and the clear teaching from the Apostle Paul here. Pray that we'd be uh, encouraged to be be immovable, to stand steady uh, in difficult times. Things may get shaky in the future. We don't know. But we know that you are faithful. And one day, You will come for your church, and we will meet you in the air. And we rejoice, and we want to be encouraged in that this morning. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.